Thank you, Ingrid. Um, Caroline, welcome. Caroline Johnson is a general practitioner in Surrey Hills, Melbourne. Her interest in primary mental health care grew out of her experience providing professional development activities for GPs as a medical educator. This led to a lecturer position at the Department of General Practice at Melbourne Uni, where Caroline has had the opportunity to teach undergraduates, postgraduates and vocational levels. She's a member of the RAC GP Expert Committee, Quality Care, um, and has represented that committee um, in various mental health and is current, has a current role as a member of the Mental Health Professionals Association, also a board member of Mental Health Australia. And in 2015, this year, she completed a PhD at the University of Melbourne, researching the... <laughs> Congratulations, Dr Johnson. Um, and that was in monitoring the depression in the GP setting. So you're going to um, enlighten us now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And don't worry, I won't share my nine-year PhD ordeal with you. Um, in fact... I, I just want to thank Ingrid for telling people to go for a walk because it kind of got a few, rid of a few extra people for me to talk to. <laughs> um, okay, so what am I, who am I? I mean, I think that is a good introduction. I am a GP and this is where I work in Surrey Hills. Um, it's a pretty cushy place to work, but I um, defend it by the fact that I'm born and bred Surrey Hills. My parents moved there in 1966 when I was one and I still am very attached to the area. I think once you live around there, you probably don't need to move. But this has been a practice um, for over 100 years. And I'm, I'm going to mainly talk about my experiences as a clinician. Um, but obviously, it's born in, in my extensive experience teaching GPs to do a better job with mental health care. And obviously, I'm an optimist. I think they do a great job. Um, so you might notice some bias in my presentation. And I don't apologise for that. Um, because I think it is a, a very important part of the work that GPs do. Okay, and unfortunately that photo's a bit old because the tree in front there, that magnificent gum tree, um, blew down in a storm last year and we're just about to replant something to replace it. Okay, I don't know if you can read that at the back. Julie, can you read the six out of seven dwarfs aren't happy? <laughs> I'm going to start with a few stats because most people believe that doctors um, base their experience on science. I actually ended up, when I started my PhD journey, not knowing what kind of researcher I was, but I pretty quickly worked out I'm a qualitative researcher. I'm much more interested in people's stories than their statistics, but I think you need to know a few statistics. I'm going to talk about the role of the GP in mental health care, and it won't surprise you to know that I believe they're very important. In fact, for those of you who are expecting a visit on the 25th of December, you only get one every year because someone's looking after Santa. He has a lot of cardiovascular risk factors, but he's still doing the job. <laughs> and I don't know if you can read that. It's, I hate cats, I want a dog scan. <laughs> I'm going to finish by talking about how you can work with GPs, because I know you're all oral health professionals, and you'll see in a minute how I've, I've, in my own teaching, have neglected you, and I want to address that today. So... All in all, you're just another brick in the wall. You are a statistic, and I think Pink Floyd got it right, and I think this is why I've moved to qualitative research, because numbers don't tell us much about lived experience, but they do help, get our, help us get our head around what's going on. So, if this is the Australian population, about this many people in a 12-month period will experience symptoms of psychological distress that would designate a diagnosis of a mental illness. We're talking about common mental illnesses in these stats, one in five. So things like depression and anxiety. And the National Mental Health Survey that was done in 1997 and again in 2007 repeatedly affirmed these stats. So looking around the room, a significant percentage of us will, in, in, in a 12-month period, experience distress that the system would say we should get help for. If we look at those surveys and say, what's people's recollection of ever having distress in their lifetime? This many of us will have experienced symptoms that say we would cross the line to have a diagnosis of a mental disorder. So it's a common problem. Half of us in our lifetime will experience distress that constitutes a health issue. If we go back though to the one in five, so this is just talking about this year, 2015, of all the people who are experiencing distress, only this many people are actually seeking help for it. And this is the big challenge for us in general practice. And it wasn't really till the mid-90s when they did the first National Mental Health Survey 
that everybody recognised, gee, this is a, a big treatment gap, an unmet need, and how are we going to address it? What was most interesting, I think, about that survey is when they asked the two-thirds of people who weren't getting help for their care, do you have any need for care, 85% of them said no. So clearly there's also a gap in people's expectations of how the health system can respond to care. That's a challenge for us as GPs, but it's also a challenge for you as oral health professionals. And I'm pretty sure there would be similar stats in your profession about people who need dental care but don't recognise they have a need for dental care. As I'm reminded every six months when my dentist sends me a letter saying, you need to come for a checkup. And my 17-year-old told me that the last time I took him for a checkup was when he was 13. So we understand, we, I hope we all understand the notion of unmet need, but particularly this, this, this you know, uncertainty about whether we need it. The news is good. Um, a recent survey said that help seeking is picking up and there's a few initiatives that account for that. So we shouldn't be too despondent, but we should also remember that sometimes the services we offer people aren't exactly what they need. Okay. So moving away from BRICS, there are lots of interesting and wonderful stories about people experiencing mental health care. And the reason I love working in general practice is I get to see the breadth. So I don't just see people with serious mental illness, I see people with a little bit of distress. Sometimes I see people who come for help with their worries and they seem less worried than me. So it's kind of nice to know that we're all in this together, but it's also important to recognise that some people's experiences are much more challenging and it's very complex as to why. So we've got to be very careful about saying, yes, this is a common experience, but at the same time recognising that for some people it's an extremely difficult experience and it's very hard for us looking from the outside to judge why that is. And I think the, the family violence information before really gives a good picture of that, that it's um, sometimes people's experiences are very complicated. It's not just their biology, it's also their social circumstances and everything else. But certainly in general practice, in a standard day of work, I would expect, you know, if I see 20 people, that I would see at least five up to 10 people who would be experiencing psychological distress, most commonly things like anxiety or the symptoms of depression, but also looking after people with serious mental illness. And I always refer here to Vincent van Gogh because even though he was never officially diagnosed, it's, if you read his, um, his letters that he wrote to his brother, it seems quite likely that he was experiencing probably both depression and, and psychosis where he had some delusional thoughts. And I think it's important to recognise that we're talking about a very broad group of people here. The other thing that I think I should share with you is we in general practice get to see a lot of people with mental illness who tell me who tell us about their experiences at the dentist. In fact, on a Saturday morning, it's not at all uncommon for me to see someone who's been avoiding a trip to the dentist um, because they've, they've got a mental health issue. Now, there's lots of reasons, I'm sure you all know, why people don't go to the dentist. But I had a conversation just in the last week with one of my patients who has a, a quite a severe phobia of cotton wool. And she says if she goes to the dentist, something like the, the, the packs that they use in the dentist can trigger panic and, and unrest. Now, it's unlikely she would tell the dentist that. It's much more likely she just wouldn't go. I have another patient who has a, quite a severe social anxiety disorder that he's dealt with very, very well over many years and with a lot of help from psychologists has managed to complete a university degree, find a job. It's been a challenging journey. And he recently said he's now reached a point where he's well enough to try and get dental care. He sought out a fancy pants dentist clinic in the city that advertised sleep dentistry and paid a big sum to go and be seen there, only to find that they don't actually put you to sleep. But they did say he should come and talk to his GP about getting some Valium before he went for his dental procedure. And I thought that was a missed opportunity, I suppose, because first of all, I was sorry that he hadn't raised with me beforehand that he had this particular phobia. I probably should have guessed. But there are lots of things that um, people with mental illness might experience coming to the dentist. And I think particularly because of the sensory nature of the work that you do, putting your hands in people's mouths and the different smells and odours and sounds that might come with dentistry, um, you might have sometimes seen people have odd and unpredictable emotional reactions to that or people get very anxious or very distressed. And sometimes that will be just the way it is and they'll just get through it and they'll go on to be... Um, well cared for with their dental health, but for some people it's a huge barrier and even verges on traumatic. Um, and so I guess it's just important for you to reflect on how you would address that when you see people who are very distressed. I think what, what I understand of the way the system works here with a stepped care and a multidisciplinary team, you probably have more opportunity to talk to people about their anxieties about dental care, but it m might sometimes be hard to pick it up because people are very good at hiding it. Okay. 
So let's move on to why I think you should think about the GP as part of that care. Um, when I was a medical student, I learned all about categorical diagnosis of mental illness and I spent a lot of time learning lists about what symptoms people had to have and for what period of time and what severity that would deem them as having a diagnosis. And um, I thought that was very important to learn for my examinations and, and I passed all my examinations and then I went into general practice and I found that very few people actually clearly crossed any particular line or fit, fitted into any particular box. I suppose this happens in lots of health areas. You know, we have lots of debates about when does someone cross the line as actually having diabetes and now that I've been a GP for 20 years I can tell you that the line that you have to cross has changed over that time. I think it's also true for hypertension. But interestingly, it's also true for mental illness and it's more complex because in my job, I see people often for very long periods of time. And so I might meet them when they're children or teenagers and they've got a bit of distress and we sort of wonder, is it just teenage angst or um, relationship problems? Is it shyness? And sometimes when you listen, and listen to a person's story over time, you realise that it's only at certain points in their life has their emotional distress become an issue for them. And this is the great thing about general practice because you can intervene early, but you can also help people when they're in severe distress. The, the challenge is having the conversation as you go. And this is just an example of a, a patient. So I often spend a lot of time when people come to me saying, I think I've got a mental health problem, saying, tell me about your life over time. So the way that you guys can help if you ever say to someone, maybe you should talk to the GP about this anxiety you've got about coming to the dentist, is don't just tell them to go to anyone. Ask if they have a GP that they know or someone they've met before, someone they trust, and if they can ask if they can have a longer appointment. Because if they're offered a standard 15-minute appointment, it'll usually be 10 minutes of fuffing around making other reasons for coming to the doctor before the real agenda comes out. So this is just to remind you of that importance of being able to talk to people about their distress at various levels along the life course. Okay. So this is probably one of my favourite books ever written by the World Health Organisation. It was written with Wonka, who, which are the World Association of Family Doctors. And they basically made a very good case for why we should be looking after mental health in the primary care setting. And I consider, obviously, oral health professionals as being part of the primary care setting. We see all players, people walk in our door for general care, and we should be aware that just as we're looking out for their physical health, we should at least be aware that they might have mental health problems. As I get older and more experienced as a GP, I find it less and less helpful to separate the two. And I get very cross by people talking about reattributing physical symptoms to the psychological realm. I don't think we need to reattribute symptoms. I think we need to help people reintegrate and think holistically about their health. So if you've got a bad toothache, it's clearly a lot worse if there's a lot of stress in your life than if you can take some time out, rest, take some analgesia. And so the mind and the body are very closely linked and that's why you're having this conference today and I can affirm that that's a very good thing to do because they are intimately linked. But in particular, we have this problem that mental health care tends to get much less um, um, attention in the health budget than physical health care. So by trying to integrate it into primary care, the hope is that it will get the percentage of funding that it deserves. So about 13% of GP consultations are specifically for a mental health problem, and yet there's nowhere near 10% of our budget that's allocated towards mental health care. The good news is that it's a cheap place to get care. It's much more um, expensive to go and see specialist mental health professionals. And while we certainly need them and we need their help for more complex problems, the aim is that many people should be able to get treatment in the primary care setting. And I'm, I'm certain that's true in dentistry as well. You know, prevention is better than cure. People getting good dental health care early when their symptoms are mild is clearly better than waiting until problems get out of control. And the even better news, if you read this book, if you're interested in the case studies they offer from all around the world, that actually people who get good quality primary mental health care have good outcomes. And this book gives stories from many countries around the world that certainly don't have strong um, systems of GPs or doctors, and many of them have only handfuls of psychiatrists, but it's the work of nurses and um, health promotion experts who can help people with their mental health. So it's certainly worth keeping up the aim and for you guys also to be interested in mental health care. So let's move on to what do GPs do. Well, because it, I'm hoping most of you have at some stage in your life been to a GP and just as I could probably give you a potted history of what oral health professionals do, you could do the same back to me. Um, mostly what GPs do is listen and look. They, they listen to... Com um, Com, you know, complicated stories and sets of symptoms. And what's really good about that is people, when they come to general practice, haven't had a chance to rehearse their story. 
So by the time they get to a hospital or by the time they get to a specialist professional, they've obviously often told their story three or four times, but we get to hear it in the raw, natural and unadulterated. And this is one of the big things we have to do training young doctors is to learn to listen to complex stories where problems haven't been filtered into neat categories. And then we have the opportunity to examine and arrange tests and do all those things um, and try and make a diagnosis. But as I've alluded to in the earlier slide, sometimes we don't make a diagnosis. We just say, you're heading somewhere, you're at risk of certain things, let's see if we can intervene early. And at the same time, we sometimes recommend specific treatments or get other people to help us through referral. So I hope there's no surprises in that slide. But I guess the, the thing I want to emphasise is when we're looking after people with mental health problems, it is certainly not a one-size-fits-all model. And this is one of the things that makes me a qualitative researcher. You know, you can read lots of guidelines and you've probably got lots of, um, read lots of articles, I'm sure, in the dental profession as well about how health professionals don't follow guidelines. Well, I would argue that's because patients don't fit necessarily very well into guidelines and we need to we certainly need to understand what guidelines recommend we need to think about the reasons why we're not applying them and it has to be a deliberate decision not a decision due to ignorance but I, particularly in the mental health field my experience is that we do lots of different things and sometimes it surprises me the things that work because they're not always the things that the textbook tells me work but let's go through some of them anyway just so you're familiar with what they might be so first of all we offer talking therapies and GPs do a lot of this, but sometimes we refer to other people. But I think any of us has the capacity to listen, um, except maybe dentists, because I remember as a kid sitting in the dentist chair and my dentist would be asking me all these very friendly questions, but of course I had no opportunity to answer them. He would just answer them for me. But it's interesting because even though the dentist couldn't really listen to me, he could only talk to me, he was a constant figure in our family life. He was the dentist that my mum started going to when she came here as a refugee in the, early, in the early 50s. And we kept going to him right up until the day he retired. In fact, even now as a 50-year-old woman, I still go to the man who bought the practice from him. So that sense of continuity of a health professional, I think, can happen in any area, in dentistry, in general practice or anything else. And I don't think you should underestimate the ability that you get to know a person over time if you listen to their stories and you get to know them. And that's why I've put the slide up, because we certainly know from our qualitative... Re Sorry? OK. We know from our qualitative research that um, um, hairdressers are an important part of support for people with mental health concerns. So I'll move on. I won't talk a lot about medications, except to say that Australia is the second highest prescriber of um, antidepressants in the developed world. So I certainly don't think you should discourage people from taking antidepressants, but I think you should always encourage them to talk to their doctor about it. And similarly, referral is complex. So that says, I oh know it's true, my shrink's more depressed than I am. What I would ask you to do when you're working with general practice is please don't um, be tempted just to say to someone, oh, I know a good psychologist, here's their name, go and see them. And matching a person to the right type of professional is much more complex in mental health than it is in most other areas of referral. So I just encourage you to keep that in mind, that sometimes it takes time and it's very difficult if someone just walks in saying, I want a referral and you've got 15 minutes with them to get the referral right. But here are some of the people we refer to, lots and lots of different pathways. So again, it's just to emphasise that if you're going to interact with general practice, you do need to be, um, be, be aware that there's a lot of complexity to it and it's not just one size fits all, there's lots of different pathways. And I should just apologise that this slide doesn't list oral health professionals, and it should. So that was one of the weaknesses of this slide, but I pre prepared it many months earlier. Okay, so I'm just gonna finish up now with talking about communication. How, just a show of hands, how many of you have ever communicated with a general practitioner by phone, letter or email? Fantastic. It's probably all, mostly, for most of you, it would have started since chronic disease management plans came in. You know, the GP writes to you, puts you on the plan and says, could you please share information about the care of patients? When, th when that communication works well, it's fantastic. It makes a really big difference. Um, but often it falls through and often it's just a, a kind of a word of mouth thing. So I just encourage you to think about how you share information with GPs and be aware that, one again, one size won't fit all, depending on the practice you're working with and the doctor. You might decide to use telephone or... Um, Internet. I'd avoid, I'd avoid email unless you have a secure emailing system because GPs won't respond to, um, to public email addresses. Okay, and I'll just finish up some of the challenges that we have um, working in general practice. Certainly, 
Um, general practice is a very time pressured environment, as I'm sure your work environment is, but also with the increasing um, part time feminisation of the workforce, GPs aren't always there every day of the week. It used to, when I was a kid, it was a, a two man job. The GP and his wife ran the practice, and they were pretty much available 24 7. That's no longer the case. It doesn't mean that you can't work with practices, but people need to think about you know, their priorities. Is it important that they just see anyone today for care, or is it more important that they have an ongoing relationship with their GP? And I would argue that the latter for mental health problems. Um, and I, I guess it's another thing, there's a lot of debate in, in the health system at the moment about whether you know, we could have big group practices and multidisciplinary teams. And I just urge a w word of caution, I think that sounds very appealing and we're going to be hearing a lot about it in the, last, in the next 12 months. But in my experience, people with mental health issues have very specific needs and they choose people for very specific reason. It's not usually because they belong to a big fancy pants team. It's usually because they trust that person for a whole lot of other complex reasons. And I think we have to be careful that we don't dismantle those natural networks in the favour of economies of scale and multidisciplinarity, even though I think they, they are also important. Okay, so just some homework for you so I can finish now. Sorry I, I rushed through it, but we were running out of time. Um, this is the Mind Health Connect website. So if any of you have a patient who says, oh, I've got OCD or I've got depression, you can go and look at Mind Health Connect. I'll give you the website on my last slide. And you can actually tick, click on mental health conditions and you can read about specific conditions. And you certainly should inform yourselves if you're dealing with the general public about their health. Secondly, if you want to read some more about self-help information that's evidence-based online, the Beacon website, again, I'll have the slide on my, my next slide, the, the web address, has some self, patient self-education material that you can get people to at least browse through in preparation for a visit to their GP. So in a nutshell, they're the two um, web resources, and I'm sorry it was such a quick talk, but I hope that's helpful for you. <laughs>